So this x-ray is a portable x-ray of an ICU patient that we have in the hospital right now. If we think about what we already talked about and what makes a film a good film or a bad film, it's pretty easy to see this is not at the top 10 of being good. It's a little rotated to the right, so that's going to make his right lung look smaller and his left lung look bigger. It's also not the best film in that the bases are cut off a little bit, so you can't quite see the bottom, but we'll still get a few things out of it that are important. So notice because it's rotated to the right, the trachea looks splayed to the right, right main stem bronchus is here, right upper lobe take off, bronchus intermedius, the left main stem bronchus is sort of lost as the aorta gets uncoiled, this pulmonary artery looks big, but again this is an AP portable film, and when you take a portable film, anything that's closer to the film is going to look bigger. So his heart also looks bigger. It's hard to tell where the edge is though because we lose it here, and then we lose it off the screen down here. But this is someone who has some patchy infiltrates probably that go past where the interlobal artery would be. This is too generous just to be arterial shadows. And down here there's a little patchy infiltrate. This is probably in the left lower lobe. It's not in the inferior lingula because you still have your left heart border. And he's probably got some patchy infiltrates starting in the right upper lobe. And then of course the radiologist has cheated and given us an arrow so that we can see the infiltrate probably in the right lower lobe. You can't say for sure if there's a middle lobe infiltrate because again with the right part being rotated because the film is rotated it's hard to tell where it is but he definitely has some patchy infiltrates here and this is a fellow who came in with community acquired pneumonia. Now the other thing to notice is how wide his mediastinum is up here at the top. The stripe from the trachea over to the mediastinal shadow here where the lung starts, the pleural stripe, is too wide but you can't count this as being mediastinal widening because the film is rotated. If this was a nice midline film and the technique was correct and you saw mediastinal widening, you'd start worrying about things happening in the mediastinum, such as bleeding, aortic dissections, um, things like that. Part of when we're talking about infiltrates, sometimes we talk about low bar infiltrates and you could almost get a sense that this is a right upper lobe low bar infiltrate. The minor fissure would be here and this is a fluid density as opposed to air up here which would be normal. And a low bar infiltrate follows the anatomy of a lobe or a segment or a subsegment. These things down here though are a bit more patchy so when the radiologist talks about patchy infiltrates on an x-ray what they're trying to say is that there is a fluid density filling the alveolar spaces, but it's not obeying the anatomy per se of a lobe or a segment. Over here, on the other hand, I would call this vascular engorgement because again, remember we talked about in a normal x-ray, you shouldn't see lung markings within a centimeter of the edge of the pleura to the lung there or the ribs, and yet you can see lung markings going almost all the way out. So whether you call these curly B lines or not, they're definitely abnormal. This would be somebody that I would think probably has volume overload and whether they have congestion of heart failure because of a weak heart or diastolic dysfunction or because they've been volume overloaded. These are certainly way too plump in the way of vasculature. But this would be probably starting to be a low bar infiltrate and it's most likely the right upper lobe anterior segment just because it's so prominent on the portable film in the front. And these would probably be little patchy infiltrates in the right lower lobe. So this is the same patient after we've treated his pneumonia and he's been on a ventilator for a few days and then we've diuresed all the fluid that we gave him to treat his sepsis. And now again a portable film so the heart structure looks bigger than normal because it's closer to the camera. The film is a little more centered. You can see his endotracheal tube up here. Still a light film though. The vasculature is still a bit prominent but you don't see the little curly B lines all the way out. Now you see the left diaphragm because they've included all of the patient on the film cartridge this time. You see a little bit of tinting right here on the edge of the heart so there may still be something trying to happen in the left lower lobe of the lingula, but now you see the right diaphragm being very flat. The infiltrate that we had seen earlier in the right upper lobe that was starting out here certainly is less prominent. Patchy stuff that we had described on his other film is no longer seen, but now you see this sort of weird haze behind it. So this is someone who actually their film was a portable, semi-erect, not upright, and what you're seeing now is a little bit of pleural fluid that is layering behind the lungs 
on the left and on the right, the infiltrates have cleared. He has pretty flat diaphragms, so we suspect he's got significant emphysema as well. So the infiltrates resolve, and now we have this new shadow, which is actually a diffuse haze, and that's probably a pleural effusion. Okay, so this would be a patient who obviously has a very abnormal x-ray and has an endotracheal tube. So even if you don't know anything about this person, you already know they're sick as stink. Here's their heart monitor. It looks like they may even have a central line over here. So this is someone in the ICU who's pretty darn sick. And if you just had to start trying to formulate in your mind some pattern recognitions of abnormal x-rays, this would be the really bad, sick pneumonia patient who has legionnaires or who has pneumocystis and maybe even is progressing to adult respiratory distress syndrome. So on this film, from the standpoint of all the logistics, it's an upright, portable film. The little beads are at the bottom of the gravity indicator. The head's turned to the right. They're rotating to the right, so the left clavicle is here, the right is here, so that's going to make your right lung look a little smaller. The endotracheal tube is well positioned. It's hard to tell where the end of it is, but the carina is probably right there based on the difference in the air tissue density. So that tube might be a little close. Monitor leads flying all over the place here. Right lung has diffuse, very dense infiltrates, but they don't follow any low bar predominance. They're just sort of smattered everywhere like someone threw paint at a wall. And on the left side, they're a little less dense, but nonetheless very diffuse. There's some vascular engorgement as well. You can follow the anatomy of the blood vessels, but this this is pretty much a very dense alveolar filling process in both lungs. There's a little trapped air right there, whether that's an early pneumothorax or just normal aerated lung when everything else around it is abnormal. Notice also that the heart borders are indistinct, so this process is hitting every part of the lung and obscures the heart border on both sides. That one you can still get, but it's obviously not smooth. There's no evidence of bare trauma anywhere yet unless that's an early pneumothorax. But this would be someone with a diffuse uh, pneumonia or infiltrative process and probably um, even heading towards ARDS. You can imagine how this person might be hard to oxygenate and ventilate because there's really no normal aerated lung there. So when someone's intubated, um, the first thing that we do once someone is intubated is we usually listen to listen for bilateral breath sounds with our stethoscope. We also use a carbon dioxide tester that we put in line um, as they're bagging the patient and you should be able to see it vacillate on each breath so that you know that the endotracheal tube is actually in the trachea, not in the esophagus. And then the, the last thing, of course, is getting a chest x-ray. A chest x-ray really should be the last way you figure out where your endotracheal tube is because, again, it's only a one-dimensional x-ray. So you're seeing that it's within this space, and then you're looking to see how far down it is. It's very important when you get that x-ray that you also have at least part of the chin on here. So this tech did a good job. You want to know where the chin is because you have to know what position the head is in to know whether the ET tube is appropriately positioned. If the head is neutral and the ET tube is at least a couple of centimeters above that carina, then you're okay. If the head is flexed or extended, of course that affects where the endotracheal tube is positioned and it might be too low or too high. So it's important to know where the neck is as well as where you see this tip. The first x-ray you do is not only to to make sure that you're not too far down, but to make sure that you haven't inadvertently caused any type of barotrauma and developed a pneumothorax from the get-go. And this one is fine.